everyone. Today's show is about customer data privacy and who has the right to use it. To help me discuss this topic is Richard Witt. Richard is the president of the Glia Foundation. Richard, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Allison. It's great to be here. Tell us a little bit more about your background, what this foundation is, what the word Glia means. These are all so many important questions as we start our discussion. Sure thing. Well, so my background is in technology, law, policy, and strategy. Uh, I've been at this in this space for over 30 years. Um, most recently, I was at Google, their corporate director for strategic initiatives, which meant I got a chance to look at a lot of really amazing cutting edge technologies and think about the implications medium and long term for society. Uh, so it was a really unique opportunity to have that sort of that, that function to look out over the horizon. Uh, before I was at Google, I spent 12 years at MCI Communications where I helped found their internet data and policy group and got a chance to initially work with, uh, meet and work with Vint Cerf, one of the fathers of the internet, which was a, a, a really tremendous opportunity. And I, he's still a friend and mentor of mine, um, which is, um, he's, he's, he's such a treasure to the, to the internet. Um, and before that, uh, I worked in private practice when I came out of law school for the very early pre-internet companies. So CompuServe uh, and uh, Prodigy, EDS, these were the late 80s, early 90s before the web really got going. Um, oh, I remember those. I, I remember people would make artwork out of like, all the AOL disks because they were trying so hard to get people online and you'd get a disk in the mail. That's exactly then, right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. And we didn't have membership names. We had numbers. I think there were like 15 digit numbers we had to memorize every time we logged in. So oh obviously a long way since then. Um, and really I've been drawn to this whole topic from watching this evolution of the internet initially, which, which Bob Kahn and Vince Cerf helped to get going in the, in the mid seventies, but really with the World Wide Web. And that's Sir Tim Berners-Lee, which you know he, he started uh, working on it in the late eighties. And really by the mid nineties, it became this commercial force in the world. Um, and watching it grow, watching the notion, notion of the client-server relationship, and all of us as users of this network. And then I think in more recent years, I think many of us have seen with some trepidation the rise of the platforms, the multi-sided platform companies for whom we are the users, in some ways the objects of these relationships, and then it's actually the advertisers and the marketers and the others who utilize their platform and pay them good money for that, uh, for the data and insights they receive from them. Um, and that over time, the, the notion of us as a user became, became more winnowed down. We started to become more passive. We were recipients of the, of the really great technologies and services without a whole lot of our own opportunity to exercise our autonomy and our agency through the web. So, you know, I left Google two and a half years ago uh, in, in part because I was increasingly concerned about the direction that Google and some of these other platform companies were taking. I'm now a fellow with Mozilla uh, foundation, but I'm also, as you mentioned, I, I started up my own foundation called Glia. Um, so Glia is the ancient Greek word for glue. And uh, I chose it for a couple of reasons. One is there's the old saying that trust is the social glue, right? Mm -hmm. That binds us together as human beings, as societies, as marketplaces. Um, and I could see that coming undone, but not just on the web, but really, I mean, many of us have witnessed this in, in the institutions, the modern institutions of the day, social, political, economic. Um, and it felt like to me, there's an opportunity here for the web itself and the technologies and the commercial relationships that we create on top of the web to bring some trust back in. That would that I believe is, is been, unfortunately been slipping away. Um, uh, the other reason I like the, the term glia is because it was actually a name given about 120 years ago to certain cells in the human brain. We're all familiar with the neurons, right? We're all very proud of having these really lightning fast neurons that make us think fast and, and do amazing work. But there's these things called the glial cells, which in the late 19th century, when they first recognized them in the brain, because they act on chemicals and not on electrical impulses, they look inert. And so they couldn't figure out what they did. And so they came up with the term, okay, they must glue the neurons together. That's their primary you know, function. Let's call them the glial cells. Well, that was, the, the, that was more or less the, the status quo for about 100 years. And then just recently, really in the, in the 21st century, neuroscience has uncovered an amazing number of things that glial cells do in terms of promoting, enhancing, protecting, repairing all the neural structures. So in some ways they are in fact sort of a, a life support system uh, for the brain. And so I like this idea of building an ecosystem that could be maybe somewhat analogous of a digital life support system for those of us in society who I think all could use 
more support, right? Protection, promotion, enhancement of ourselves and our digital selves uh, on the web. So that was sort of another, another connotation I liked in, in choosing the word glia. Oh, very nice. And I, I love what you said about the promotion, enhancement, protection. That is such a nice match. But let's, let's um, tie this to something that we recently have all been talking about. And that's the, you know, the infamous Netflix movie, The Social Dilemma, which basically mm -hmm. posits that some of the largest tech companies, probably all of them, have used our data, not just to nudge us in a particular direction, which, you know, we all kind of expect from advertising, but to actively create these passionate addictions. And to many of us, this really feels like a big breach of trust and, and it should, but it's further concerning because at least from our point of view, we think about how companies are using customer data. And so if tech giants were doing this years ago, we know that everyday companies that we interact with could be just a few steps behind. So the question I have for you is, has the horse left the barn? <laughs> is it too late <laughs> for us to reclaim anything in our data? It's, it's all spread out there so aggressively. And if, it, if so, how can we trust companies with that data? Well, I guess I would answer that, let's see, no, no, and it depends. So uh, yeah, the horse has not yet left the barn, although it's, it's definitely uh, gearing up to, to bust through um, the, <laughs> the open doorway there uh, into the fields. Um, you know, the web is still an adolescent. We have to remember that it actually, it's, it's quite young. Uh, it's only been around, as I said, commercially since roughly the mid nineties. So our experience of it is still fairly new and fresh. And I think one of the, the things the platform companies have, have taken advantage of um, is utilizing the web in a way that we basically get a bunch of free stuff in exchange for the data that they extract from us. Uh, and that I is- I want to clarify just briefly, like yes. web 1.0 was um, what we originally had when you had individual websites, but web 2.0 is more platforms and networks and integrations. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, that's and, and that's the way a number of analysts think about it. The web, the, the notion of the client server relationship is the basis of the web. That, you know, we are in fact on the client side and the servers out in, in what has eventually become the cloud it's where all the activity happens. That's where the websites are. And so our web browsers take us to the websites and that's where the interactions occur. And in the web 2.0 configuration, Google was really the first one to figure this out uh, when, they, when they matched up ads and search back in, back in 2000, roughly 20 years ago. Um, but Facebook and many others uh, followed suit. And the idea was they could create a platform. Uh, and this is an economic term. It's not a technology term. It goes back to the ancient, the ancient Greeks again. It's the agora, right? It's the, it's the place you go to where buying and selling and bartering and trading happens. Um, and in this case, the platform companies figured out that if they were able to sort of extract data from users, um, that data would be very valuable to advertisers and marketers and others in terms of the insights that they give. Uh, so valuable, in fact, that they, the platform companies can afford to give us all these amazing services and applications essentially for free. Right for free, of course, in in scare quotation marks. For market. free, yes, yes. The freedom, the freedom there is the freedom um, to to have them know, you know, what you ate for dinner last night, um, and and what your size of your jeans are, and a whole bunch of other things, right? So, um, so you know, and, and I I think many people are okay with that. I mean, until recently, I think, and the social dilemma, I think, I I think provides a really great community service here we didn't understand the, the depths of this. There was this concept that, well, you sort of take my data and then you get some insights from it and I get my free stuff and that's all good. Um, and the social dilemma demonstrates, I think uh, quite effectively, why it goes beyond that. It's not just about understanding us and who we are, it's about influencing us. And the word that comes up again and again in, in the documentary, and I think again, quite, uh, quite uh, with good reason, is manipulation. And in mm -hmm. fact, at the writings I've been doing uh, in the past couple of years, the analysis I've been doing, I, I uh, employ a term I call the seams cycle, S-E-A-M-S. -E and the notion here is, is, is this feedback loop that's constantly being created multiple times in, during the course of a day and your interactions with the web. The S is the, for the surveillance, the devices that are in your environment that are studying you, watching you, waiting for something to happen. Um, think of the Alexa sitting in your living room always sort of on, on standby, always on, right? Always listening and every now and then popping up with an answer that you didn't ask for. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly right. And if you have a daughter named Alexa, it becomes even more awkward. Uh, and E is for extraction. So it's actually pulling the data from you, from the environment. Uh, the A is for analysis. That's the computational side. That's these algorithmic uh, operations, which again, in the documentary, they demonstrate with those three gentlemen standing there trying to figure out how they're going to you know, extract the maximum value out of the interactions and then the data they draw from the interactions. And then the M of the seam cycle is, is manipulation. So uh, when I originally came up with that two years ago, I thought manipulation sounds like quite a strong term. Some people might push back on it, but I'm now seeing it everywhere. And Shoshana Zuboff, who wrote uh, Surveillance Capitalism, uh, again, did a masterful job of demonstrating the depths to which it's not just taking our data and selling us things we might want. It's trying to sell us things that they're not sure we want or they want to influence or manipulate us into wanting. And the, mm -hmm. and the selling is not just about goods and services. It can be about viewpoints politically. It can be about your vote. It can be a whole number of things and that these interactions in some ways are trying to define you. And so and, that and I think is the real scary. concern. You know, it, yeah. it's, it's um, th through all this experimentation, they have found how to really effectively influence people um, about much more than goods and services. I think that's that's where all of us kind of said, oh my gosh, <laughs> stand right. up and take notice. It's one thing to watch, you know, an advertisement on television or even in the movie theaters or, you know, see ads in, in your newspaper. Um, that's a relatively passive experience. Um, their ability now is to make this a two-way experience, but one that they control, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's the part. And, um, you know, I think Tristan Harris put it well. It's not that we're reaching the point in the singularity where the, the computers sort of take over from human strengths. We're actually at a point much earlier than that where they are in fact taking advantage of our human weaknesses. They know us psychologically better than we know ourselves. And that I think creates some real grave risks for us, again, as a matter of being in the marketplace, but also you know, as the social fabric we, we inhabit, the political systems we try to build uh, for ourselves. Um, there's, there's so many implications here in a way that, so that I think, um, so on the one hand, there's time to change. The, the horse hasn't left the proverbial barn yet, but on the other hand, there's a lot of machinery here that's been embedded in place over the last decade or two with the platforms that we need to figure out how to, how to unharness and allow us as human beings to have more, more recourse and more say. And, and I want to talk about the machines a little bit because we oftentimes think about this as algorithms. Um, you know, being an algorithmic leader means that you can really use the data behind everything your company is touching in order to know your customers better and serve them better. But I oftentimes think about this in a little bit of a U-shaped curve. Um, there's a certain point where you kind of have to stop pushing so hard because even though we can drive sales higher, we may have a responsibility to the customer equity, to the, the goodness of our customer base, to the sustainability, to the environment, all the ESG groups in order to um, further maintain the quality of our company, not just the sheer volume of sales. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, I think, another challenge that's been created by the rise of the platform companies on the web is that they essentially inhabited this notion of userhood, right? So we are not technically, in their minds, customers or patrons or clients, right? We, over and over again, we are their users. And by sort of uh, their, their true customers- Tron here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Their true customers and clients and patrons are the advertisers and the marketers and the retailers from the other end of the platform, right? Um, and so they, we, uh, because we always were users under the web, we just maintain that status now on the platforms. And so they don't really view us as being part of what I would consider a healthy give and take commercial transaction interaction relationship, right? They see us as a resource to be mined. Um, and that is... Again, that, that is one of, the, one of the things I think we need to try to come to grips with is that the web has really taken a turn. It's, it's this ultimate, it's an incredible market-based system, but yet it's leaving behind all the indicia that makes for a healthy marketplace, which is willing buyers, willing sellers, a meeting of minds, uh, and treating us, again, not as users, but as you're saying, as customers. You do, you know, in, in, in a true commercial relationship, you don't push the boundaries, right? Because right. you want to maintain that long-term relationship is sustainable. It benefits both sides. Um, when you're a user, that pushing the boundaries that you mentioned, the U-curve, um, that's probably way far on one side or the other. It's not in a place where in most normal commercial transactions, 
you know, somebody trying to sell me something, uh, you know, would otherwise would sort of back away from because it feels like you're, you're going past a certain point. Those, right. those points don't seem to exist online. Do you, do you think the paradigm is the same? I mean, we're talking about the platform companies largely and the big mm -hmm. tech players. Is the paradigm the same for a corporation that maybe doesn't have as much data to work with and they don't have an advertising model? They're basically selling product. Does the mm -hmm. same problem of treating the customers as a resource still exist? I think it can, yeah. And you know, this may be some of my own personal viewpoint here, but I think when you get to, when corporations get to a certain size and scale, um, I think it is harder for them to see the people that they are you know, working with, serving on a daily basis as actual customers and clients, as opposed to you know, points on a spreadsheet. So mm -hmm. I think there is a certain sort of, uh, uh, I don't know what the term would be exactly, it's sort of a withdrawal or a pullback a bit from the human dimension of being somebody's customer when you have that kind of scale and scope going on. So when you have that in the web, when that's, when that's then attached to the web sort of ethos of the seam cycles I've talked about, I think that exacerbates that sort of notion of, of us being these sort of abstract entities to them rather than flesh and blood. Yes, I, I completely agree with you here. One of the things we talk about all the time is the distancing language that's used to express yeah. data and analytics. I'm not a person, I'm an eyeball or an impression or a view or different things that are not human things, um, not people describers. Yeah. Yeah. And that even gets to the obsession with data itself, right? We talk about data as if it's this thing sitting on a ledger somewhere that you make some money off of. Um, data is, uh, and I like to say data has become a four letter word, um, but it is a very, from an economic standpoint, uh, it is a very unique resource. It is not a fixed asset. Um, mm -hmm. And in fact, um, and, and if you think about it, yeah, there's certain indicia about ourselves, like our identities, you know, things like my social security number and my credit card number, there's certain aspects of me that are fixed and obviously very sensitive. I don't want to be sharing, but so many other things about us is about our experience. It's about things that are meaningful to us. So for example, the fact that I bought that pair of shoes last week on the web, uh, there could be a dozen reasons why I bought those particular shoes at that particular time. All that is known is that that is a data point and that data point is then fixed to me as if it somehow is meaningful about me as a human being. And it may be, but it also may not be. So mm -hmm. I prefer to think about data as much more about a flow of experience and meaning. The term I use is, is a life stream, a digital life stream. Mm -hmm. um, I think tries to get us away from this idea of this, of this sort of fixed thing, this asset, this resource that key, again, to be extracted uh, from the environment. And if you talk to economists, they will say, putting aside for a moment that, that notion sort of the flow of data you know, data is a, is a combination of a couple of unique elements. One, it's non-fungible, which means essentially it's unique. There's no data point that's exactly the same as another data point because the context around it is always different. And that context often gets lost in the data stream when companies are trying to take a look at us. Second, it's what they call a partially excludable, which means you can, using technologies and other things, prevent people or limit people from getting access to it. So it's not completely out in the world. It's something you have some control over um, in terms of controlling the access to it. And the third, and I think by far the most important thing is it's what they call non-rivalrous. A non-rivalrous good, which means that more, many people can benefit from it multiple times over. So you can share your data with 20 different places, let's say people, individuals, companies, governments, they can all make uses of it which actually uh, enhances the value. And, and in some ways, there's a multiplier effect. The more data you share with more people, um, the more value that's generated, again, mutually, not just for you, but for all the people you share it with. And when you look at a platform company or other you know, large retailers or others online, they have a very narrow conception of you. This is what they want to know from you, as much to know so that they can take that away and then try to sell you something. But if you could front tap into that non-rivalous nature of the data of you as an individual or as a member of society, as a family member, a friend, a part of a larger group, all those aspects of that data share with multiple parties, you get more value from it as do they. So society benefits from having data be this non-rivalous thing. And the irony again to me is the more data protection laws you put in place, the more privacy legislation you pass, the more safeguards you ensure that people are fully protected in terms of their data leakage, that's good from a certain perspective, but socially, it's actually not so great because that value that of that, of that data 
could be immense for all kinds of reasons, both economic and non-economic. Um, I, and I, I love that concept because yeah. it goes so closely to the tribes concept and companies acting more as a magnet for different tribes of people. And when you have non-rival or data, you're then able to see which tribes am I attracting? Who is really in my customer base? And you know where, where can I find them? They're not just a name, address, and phone number or a DMA. They are the life stream of activities. And maybe right. at a certain point, they're mine and they are appropriate for me. And then at another point, maybe they're not. Yeah. And if I'm the person who paid Google to put that ad for those shoes online and I bought those shoes, they're happy, but that was sort of a one-off. And mm -hmm. so what's that, what do they do next? Well, typically what I see, I think maybe it's experience, I see those same shoes follow me around the web for weeks and weeks afterwards. <laughs> and it's like, okay, that's no good for me. It's wasting my time. It's wasting your money. Wouldn't it be better if you knew that I was very happy with the shoes? And in fact, I would love to find some matching jeans. How yeah. do we create that connection? Right now, you can't really do that online because the platform sits in the middle and essentially is sifting all these insights for their benefit. The retailers get some of it, but they don't get the full, the full value. And nor do I as the user slash customer or client. So this notion of the non-rivalryness is also, if I, can, if I can lower my barriers, if I feel comfortable, if I trust you in a relationship, so it comes back again to this idea of trust, then I'm willing to share more data. That data becomes more valuable to both of us. Um, and then we're off to the races and, and you can create a much better, to me, a much better commercial um, set of interactions and even true relationship, not just sort of these one-offs we see online. But I wanna pick up on this concept where you're talking about the platforms making the match as opposed to um, where else I might place my trust if I'm a consumer and I need to broker my data. Um, there have been suggestions of, oh, I can put my data on the blockchain and get a dollar per transaction. <laughs> is, yep. is that the right avenue that consumers should be thinking about? Or is there another way to go about trust and creating the, all the benefits of sharing data with limited downsides? Yeah, that's a great question. So this is, I think we're shifting from, if we see that it's not just a problem, the web today is a problem, there also is opportunity, right? There's a lot of value to be unlocked here that frankly, and again, ironically, we all think the platform companies have it all figured out, they're making money hand over fist, their stock is through the roof, and yet they are still basically stuck in a business model of roughly 20 years gone by. True. And we're all, seeing, we're all seeing the weaknesses in it. We're all seeing that they're not making the true human connections that could in fact unlock more value for everybody. Um, so the, you know, my, my conception of this is, you know, we, we are now in the 21st century uh, and we, we, need, we need help. So back to the glial concept, we need someone we can trust and we need that kind of support level. Um, and what I found compelling in my research that I've been now doing some writing and talking about um, is that going back to the common law fiduciaries. So fiduciaries are the original this goes back to uh, sort of the mid, mid uh, middle ages, roughly of England, but also Europe. But the concept behind fiduciaries are, is very interesting. It's about uneven commercial relationships where one entity has power over somebody else. And that power can come from a certain expertise, can come from certain confidences that are shared. It could come from a certain socioeconomic status. There are a variety of ways that that power can be exhibited. But the bottom line is when you have power over somebody else and there's an attempt to create a commercial relationship, the one with power has certain duties to me. And mm -hmm. the two commonly cited duties in fiduciary law are the duty of care, and the duty of loyalty. And the examples of fiduciaries are actually all around us in the analog real world. Uh, so we have doctors, we have lawyers, uh, right? We have certain financial advisors, uh, not all of them. <laughs> there are, some of them try to escape it, but there are certain ones, in fact, they advertise openly that we are a fiduciary. We we have a higher standard, right? Um, librarians, interestingly, uh, they treat us as patrons. They zealously guard our library records. You may remember after 9-11, uh, you know, there was an attempt to get access to certain library records of these librarians. And they were like, no way, we have a fiduciary duty of loyalty wow. to our patrons. When they check out a book, we are not gonna tell the US government what that book is. Um, so they, that, that's a similar kind of uh, you know, example there. So the, the, the point is we have these entities today in our real world lives and even go stretching onto things like dry cleaners, right? They have a certain bailment obligation to us, duty of care towards our, our garments, uh, things like that. When you hand a car to the guy to, to park your car at the restaurant, make sure he's not gonna drive away with it because there's a certain notion that he has a bailment as they call it, another common law duty. But the point is we have all these duties in the real world 
there's none of these duties in the digital world. We have nobody who is acting, as I would put it, as our digital agent online to go back to, as you said, protect, enhance, promote the various con the very concepts of having a sort of a support system for us. We have none of that. We are completely on our own. And so I believe we should be taking some of these lessons from fiduciary laws and, uh, and, and the common law and importing that into the digital space and in fact, creating a whole new breed uh, of, of professionals, of digital agents, giving us a duty of care, which means don't harm me, and a duty of loyalty, which means promote my best interests without having any conflicts of interest. Uh, these are high duties, right? But this is the same kind of thing. If you're going to a doctor because something hurts, you're going to your lawyer because you're being sued, um, you're going to your uh, you know, certain financial advisor because you've got some convoluted arrangement you want to make to, to sell something. These are all important, sensitive relationships where you're, you know, you're relying on their expertise and giving them confidences. We're doing the same thing online. We just don't call it that. When we're sharing our data, mm -hmm. whether, it's, whether it's deliberately or surreptitiously being taken from us, those are, that is sensitive information that's flowing back, you know, to these entities. And so I feel like there should be an opt-in situation where we have companies uh, and others who want to work with us as fiduciaries, where we now get that full benefit of being a customer or a client to them and no longer just a user. Are you saying that the company can take on the mantle of that duty of care or that a third party should take on that duty of care, like um, maybe a 21st century FICO? Yeah, so it could go either way. So you could have an entity decide that it wants to step up to be a fiduciary. So have that direct relationship with its customer as a fiduciary, some sort of a duty you know, that's agreed to with them contractually, or maybe they're part of a professional association. Like a doctor with a hospital. Exactly. Yeah. Or you could have a third party arrangement. So it could be you're, the company maybe still treats you at normally as it would today as a customer, but that maybe there's some other entity, um, some other fiduciary, some called a data trust uh, is one, ex one example people point to, um, which is a similar idea, which is collectivizing my data, pooling it, and then having third parties get access to it. There's a variety of arrangements, which is, I think is also really exciting, is that as many different ways you can imagine having these online connections and interactions you want to turn into relationships, there are different examples from the common law, fiduciary law, bailment law, trust law, et cetera, um, that all could fit in and, and actually fit in quite nicely because these are developed over hundreds of years in all kinds of human situations. And the mm -hmm. notion that the online world is that much different it really isn't true, right? It's the same, it's the same power dynamics or, or, and control and access dynamics that we have online as we do offline. Um, and so no surprise, I think these common law aspects, these principles work quite well when you put them in the online setting. So I, I want to take one issue up about, we talk about the power of, of the fiduciary having a duty for care and loyalty, but what I didn't hear there is transparency. Mm. Is there also a requirement to be transparent about what data is known about a particular person. And, yeah. and this particularly from a company lens, I think companies are oftentimes wondering, should I tell people what I know about them or am I opening up a mess? Yeah, no, the, the, so the short answer is yes. There's a duty of transparency. There's a duty of good faith. There's a duty of confidentiality. These are what they call, call the so-called secondary duties because in some, some scholars have, have suggested that between care and loyalty, you sort of cover the whole waterfront. <laughs> There's not much <laughs> left between those two, but others have said, no, no, you should have a separate, you know, clearly enunciated set of duties around these other aspects to so be confidential, to be transparent, have good faith. I think there's a few others. Um, so, but yeah, depending either way, as you look at it, those are clearly understood as becoming, they would be part of that kind of, that kind of relationship. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and so what is your personal opinion? If, if I were running a company today and I said, okay, we are going to really make a play for good customer relations. And to that effect, when you log into your account, we're going to show you everything we know about you, kind of like Facebook did after mm -hmm. Cambridge Analytica. Mm -hmm. Is this a way that companies should be trending with or without a third party in place? Yeah, so I think... Um... I, I think that certainly would be a step forward. Um, and and it, it, again, it comes down to what, what the customer or consumer or client wants. Some may not have any interest in that, right? So you don't just say, oh, here's something we got about you. But for those who have an interest, I think being fully transparent about the data that's collected can be a very useful tool. 
uh, and also a way to to start building further trust. Trust. Because it all comes back to where, you know, this trust is this sort of endless cycle. Um, and you don't just start with it. You have to sort of build it over time. And so I think opening yourself up in that way to be transparent, um, I think could be a first step. And it, it, one of the, the nice things about it is while fiduciary law comes from the law, you can be a fiduciary, you can step up to those obligations and not necessarily have to import all of the legal system into that. It's, it's, it's what they call a private law regime. So you could do it through contract. You can do it by being part of a professional association of, let's say, digital fiduciaries, where you all agree that these are the principles you'll abide by and you put them on your website and it's all very clear. You know, but this they, association they, doesn't exist yet, right? Like, it, well, no, no, not, yet. No, not yet. Uh, not yet. I, I have some, I have some near term, near term hopes that something like that can get off the ground because I think the time is is right. I think there's I think there's room for this. I think there's appetite for this. Um, if I can be involved in some small way, that would be great. Um, but yeah, but I think companies can companies don't need to wait on that. They don't need to wait on an act of Congress. They don't need to wait mm -hmm. on their Secretary of State to announce a new kind of corporation and that takes these these you know, principles in. They can just start doing them now and just post them to the world, let the, put their users on notice for that. Um, and then I think that act by itself or those acts by themselves could really start to build some of these trust levels where you can start talking about this mutual exchange of data that, that creates value for both sides. So along those lines, just yesterday, World Wide Web founder Tim Berners-Lee announced uh, through his startup, Interrupt, that an enterprise version of the solid privacy platform uh, is now available and it's supposed to allow large organizations and government to build applications that put their users in control of the data. Is that what you see as a solid step forward? Is that an example of a fiduciary? Um, it is a, it's a technology platform that very easily could include a governance mechanism that's basically fiduciary, right? So they could call it a fiduciary. They don't, they don't do that today, but the intention behind it clearly is it is that this is a, a new form of technology platform that is intended to um, let people have much more control over the data, keep the data localized within like a localized cloud. So they have much more control and access over it. Uh, and and uh, it's actually an example of what I call edge tech, which is technologies that are built specifically for empowering people at the edge of the network. And his, in his example, Sir Tim's project uh, is based on what he calls personal online data stores or pods. So your data is sitting sort of in this certain location nearby you. Um, and so that, that by itself, you have more control over who can access that. But there's mm -hmm. other forms of these edge, these kind of edge tech technologies. There's one that I'm really fond of that's developed by Sandy Pentland at MIT, which he calls Opal. Uh, and Opal is about an open, uh, is an algorithmic open algorithm uh, concept. And there, if you sort of, you can also almost pair that with the solid. So if your data is local, what Sandy's project would do is say, the computation moves to the data. Today on the web, as you know, everything is the other way around. All of our data goes to the web and in fact sits on the web. And we can all remember back you know, to all the different data breaches that have happened over the past three, four, five years. Equifax was one of the big ones, right? Um, and they find hundreds of millions of dollars. And my, my thought there when I first heard about it was this is kind of crazy. Equifax needs my data for maybe an average of three times a year. If they're running a credit report on me or something. They don't need it sitting on their very open <laughs> um, vulnerable uh, server farms 24 by seven. Uh, when in fact they come what they call honeypots for all the, the cybersecurity hackers to swoop in on and try to try to get at. Um, so why can't we just create a situation which I think Solid plus Opal would allow, which is they move their computation to where my data is, they they come through the appropriate access points, my fiduciary or my agent or whoever gives them the appropriate you know thumbs up, they come through, they access whatever data they need to run the credit report. But then they leave the data where it is. They take back essentially the insights, the insights hmm. necessary to complete the report. But those insights don't have to be sensitive. They can just be enough to sort of say, you know, your score is 807 or whatever it is. Um, so they go back with what they, what they need to run their business, but the actual underlying sensitive data stays with me. So that's right. an example of what I call an, an, edge, an edge pull technology where I'm pulling the computation to where my data is you run the, you know, you run the algorithms, they go away and I am all the more protected behind my, you know, fully encrypted uh, wall around myself uh, and they have what they need to, to do their business. So that's, these are the kinds of ideas 
uh, around these edge tech technologies that I think if you combine that with a fiduciary who helps you manage that, then you have that much more power and control over your data. But again, that power and control then gives you the ability to say, I, I'm willing to now make myself vulnerable to certain entities to share these insights, share my data with you because I have more level of trust that it's going to go to a good place and end up, you know, benefiting me. Mm -hmm. So that's, anyway, so it's, it's, that's the sort of the two-step dance within the Gleonet project is it's the fiduciary governance structure of an entity willing to take on those duties. And it's the, it's the technology, the edge tech in this case, uh, personal AI is another one that we can talk about if you like, where, where I now have much more control over my data and my digital self online. But it, it sounds like the, I, what I'm sensing here is a little bit of a critical mass um, challenge where, you know, I've got my own company data and I've got my individual data and all of these are very small nodes, you know, discrete mm -hmm. data points and in, in my digital life cycle, but you only really get power out of a network effect when you've got a lot of critical mass from the adoption of the edge tech, from the use of Opal, from a, basically what a platform can bring. Are we seeing the evolution of the big platforms or are we seeing perhaps an opportunity for a third party to come in and become the next Google or the next Facebook? Yeah, so there are some, there's some signs. Uh, in an interview last year, Mark Zuckerberg commented on the fact that he, I think it was actually, he was asked a question about being a fiduciary. And he said, well, we think we already are acting as a fiduciary on behalf of our, our users. The fact he used the term users and the fact that nobody really believed him, I think sort of <laughs> shows that that didn't really go very far. But it was interesting, at least in his mind, that that is either something that they have already looked at or they are exploring. I think much more interesting, near term, about a month ago now, there was an article in The Economist where uh, Alphabet, which is the holding company for Google, um, was, was it indicated, the reporter indicated that one of the things they're looking at as a way of sort of moving forward, moving ahead beyond their existing business model is become a data fiduciary on behalf of their users. Um, so I find that fascinating. And I think if, if they did, if they went about it in good faith, that could, you know, overnight, that could completely change the conception of what this thing is, really elevate this in people's mind as a truly viable way of doing business. Um, so those are just sort of data points we don't really know for sure. Um, but I also think this is, a, this is room now for, in fact, smaller players to get involved. Uh, as we talked about earlier, they, in some cases, they're the ones who are closer to their customers. They know them better, perhaps. They're not at the same sort of distancing and remove that some of the larger corporations might be. So they might be the ones who are primed to actually take advantage of being uh, of this new approach where, again, they could get access to data that the larger platform companies may not be able to. And particularly with data protection laws, you know, we've got GDPR in Europe, we've got CCPA, now CPRA in California. Um, the actual, the notion of owning and controlling access to someone else's data is becoming expensive. It's becoming compliance risk. Uh, and so if you can do a business where, in fact, you don't need to touch the data, you're just getting the insights you need to, in fact, then turn around and do some good things on behalf of that customer. That's a way that right now the platforms are not equipped to, to, uh, to go to. So um, I, I think they can certainly try to take it on, but I really think it's much more intriguing to, to think about various ways that existing retailers, um, uh, you know, online and offline, for example, financial institutions, ISPs, mm -hmm. uh, could, could step into this, basically this breach, this opportunity and say, we're going to take this on um, and become your digital fiduciary and also give you this really cool technology at the same time. So let's say they did that. And, and I understand the transactional relationship that might exist between the fiduciary and the company who's trying to do more with the data. And especially in that um, third part of your model where the give and the get, the sharing of the data gives you much broader benefit. Mm -hmm. Is it possible for a company to, or, or a senior executive to go back to their board and say, we're gonna quantify the value of customer trust. This is so important to us. And you know, it's been a concept that I think every company would easily agree that it's critical to their brand, but is it possible to quantify it? That's a great question. I, I've been seeing more reports coming out just the last year or two where, where um, I think researchers are trying to do just that, try to identify you know, a metric by which you can measure what trust is. So 
I look at it in sort of in two ways. One is the upside of trust, which is if you have more trust, what that does in terms of potentially more revenue for you, uh, you know, ways of expanding your business model, expanding the product line. Um, but the downside when you don't have the trust is mm. hampers your ability to do some of these things. And that also, again, gets me back to compliance world, I guess, because I'm a lawyer um, by training. Um, I, I think the idea of owning and controlling someone else's data is going to become more and more expensive. It's going to become a cost that because between the fact of all the, all the different compliance regimes you have to put in place, and then on top of that, all the, the fines that come out of breaches and that come out of misuses of data, there's only going to be more and more and more of that now increasingly in the United States, not just in Europe. So, so it's, it's both the value of the trust that I think is worth exploring, but it's also the downside of owning and controlling, you know, someone else's data. Risk. Mm -hmm. Risk. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that always, uh, that re resonates. Um, I, I, I'm sure, you know, from the legal perspective, any company when they're trying to size up the risk, that's always yeah. a big hot issue. <laughs> right. But I think here you can actually look both directions, right? So I think it actually, yeah. it, 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 there's there's a you know there's benefit a, a, risk. yeah there's a benefit and a cost that both together I think makes the notion of trust as something of value uh, on your balance sheet as as something that's right. worth exploring. Right. So Richard, let's say that um, that I run a company or I'm a senior executive at a company. What should I do first? How should I how should I you know? And I, I'm interested in this concept. I I want to start exploring these ideas and seeing how they fit for my company. Where should I begin? Well, um, as I said, I think there's some good research that is being done out there just on this question of trust, for example, the value of trust. So I would uh, I would endeavor to get your <laughs> get your best people to pull together some solid reports on what that looks like, uh, and then get your uh, you know get your general counsel to to write a, uh, an accompanying report on the risks and challenges of of compliance and um, enforcement around data protection laws and all that kind of all those kinds of things. So I think it's, it, again, coming back to the formula you mentioned before, it's really sort of exploring those two worlds. Um, and then I think it's getting creative around what it is to inject these degrees of trust into the existing relationship. You mentioned one earlier, right? Becoming transparent about the data that you're collecting um, about somebody. Um, I think that that kind of a step is an important one that instills the trust and also starts to take you down the road of becoming a fiduciary. So you could actually, and this is the part that I think is the sort of the, the ultimate end game would be to agree either on your own terms or maybe using uh, an ecosystem of third parties, as you mentioned, um, that somehow you get these fiduciary duties of care and loyalty injected into these interactions. Um, because I think that, that that's the way to raise the trust. It's also the way that these duties as they play out over time opens up access to, to the data, opens up access to, uh, to these insights. Right, because it's not as you're saying. It's not about the data. It's ultimately the insights. It's the information, the knowledge you gather from the data. So the further you can go down the road of assembling those data, the data into meaningful terms, um, the, the better for you. And I think I think really the notion of if you're if you walk down the street and there's one doctor who is licensed uh, as you know as a physician under the the appropriate professional code, the doctor right next door has nothing like that on the door. I know which one you're probably more inclined to walk into. Um, and so similarly, I think over time, it becomes known that these fiduciary duties and obligations um, and the relationships create these zones of trust that, that people are more attracted to, right? That there's evidence that people will go there and use their services. Then that's, then that I think also by, also is another sort of set of data points around the, the value of it. And I, I think there's also something hidden in, in your last comment, which has to do with what we didn't talk much about, which was about the algorithms and the, when you talk about insights and the fiduciary duties of care and loyalty, transparency and other things like that, it seems to me that you're then putting an ethical lens on top of the outputs of the algorithms. So a lot of times an algorithm will come up with interesting things, but people don't always think about should we? <laughs> right. It's it's can we? How do we? And then what are you know the the ethical piece is like? Oh, over there in the corner, there's you know Bob saying something that we should probably. <laughs> listen to, but let's go. <laughs> right, dusting off his Aristotle's Ethics book and say, well, we should think about this maybe. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, that, that when ethics is baked in from the outset, and that again, you know, that is another issue with the web. If the technology can do it, somebody's going to find a way to do it, and. 
the ethical side of it sort of goes off to the wayside. One other thing I'll mention real fast, she talked about algorithms. I'm a fan of the idea of a personal AI. So this is an AI that resides on my device um, that in fact interacts with other AIs. So in addition to having an entity of human beings, a fiduciary of some sort, and maybe other kinds of technologies like data pods and identity layers and stuff, you can have an actual algorithmic system and machine learning based system trained on you that interacts with all of that stuff for you. And because it's being programmed and managed for you by your fiduciary, you can trust it, right? Because it's going to do things that benefit you. It's not going to be Alexa sitting in your living room waiting to listen for something so they can try to sell you, you know, sell you what they want. It's walking into your living room and this AI tells Alexa, shut up for the next four hours. It's family time, right? Mm -hmm. So it gives you more control over your digital environment. So I'm excited about the prospects there and there are things happening at universities and startups where I think the next three to five years, we're going to see a rise of these kind of digital agents, which accompanied by these governance structures and, and new ways of thinking about data. I think there's a, there really is a potential whole new evolution of the web, maybe a web 3.0 that's staring us in the face. Oh, that's, that's perfect. I, I, I love that note, Richard. That'll be our, our ending note. And okay. uh, thank you so much for joining us today and bringing these concepts of the fiduciary and the the way that we should be thinking about customer data and sharing and trust and just all these great elements together. I personally can't wait to have my own um, personal AI to manage all these <laughs> other pieces around me because I know every, so <laughs> just a side note, I'm, I'm married to a person who's very technical and every time I have to architect, like out architect the network in order to just turn the TV on, I would love to have an AI that did all that for me. <laughs> That'd be great. Well, the line the line forms behind me, but as long as you get like your husband does, then you're 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 in good good, good hands. <laughs> as always, links to everything we discuss will be at ambitiondata.com slash podcast. Um, Richard, can I put a link over to Gleonet and any other specific papers you want me to include? Yeah, please. www.glia.net. Uh, that's G-L-I-A. And then the Twitter handle is Richard S. as in Sam Witt, all one word. And uh, thank you again, Allison. This was great fun. Thank you, Richard. Remember everyone, when you use your data effectively, you can build customer equity. It is not magic. It's just a very specific journey that you can follow to get results.